Hey everyone, Coach Powers here, and today I want to talk about the five steps of recovery on the path of recovery. As outlined uh, by the Powers Manual, that's the program I've created over the last 10 years, worked with people from all around the world, probably well over a thousand people, I would say at this point. And this is a kind of a five-step outline that I present on my in my school, excuse me, the Benzo Recovery School. So this is from my program and just sort of a a loose roadmap, if you will, that sort of guides you through the process so you guys have a sense of kind of the methods behind my madness, so to speak. So step number one, and this is extremely important, and again, this is a linear sort of de- developmental system here, if you will. We begin with psychoeducation and hope restoration. And this is everything, right? This is, I mean, this is everything where you should begin. Psychoeducation. Why psychoeducation? Well, because for one, this is a very complex subject. Now, many of you already probably have, you know, an honorary PhD in all things benzo, right? If you're listening to this, I mean, you know way more about benzos than you ever wanted to know. That said, there's still a lot of bad information out there, not just on benzos, not specifically benzos per se, but the ramification, the, the implication, you know, the, the, the effect that benzo has on the limbic system, for example. Everything is sort of framed under this umbrella of GABA-A receptor damage. Well, the truth is it's, it's bigger than that, right? We have all these other chemicals that are uh, playing a role here cortisol, norepinephrine, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin. Yes, even our natural production of GABA. There's all these other hormones and receptors that also play a role. And it's very important to understand sort of the 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 basics of this, how this works. For example, something that I've come to call the benzo-induced loop of mental illness. To me, if you don't know what that is, if you don't understand the self fueling mechanism of all of this or how benzo withdrawal can create these additional disorders within us and how those things need a certain nuance to be treated, this all becomes so much more difficult, right? So psychoeducation is huge. And in my school and my program, it's the biggest emphasis. If you start working with me, you're immediately going to go through a kind of mini psychological course on all of this. Second, you know, the second part of step of step one is hope restoration. Why is this important? My friends, if we don't have hope, we have nothing. We are dead in the water, right? And I don't, I don't mean false hope, right? Because first off, let me ask you a question. How many of you know the difference between true hope and something like wishful thinking? So I'll tell you, real hope has a path forward, whereas wishful thinking does not. Right? We need money. We can just sort of wish that money will fall on our lap. But having a path on maybe how to make money, all right, well, that might provide hope, even if that path on making money is a long shot or a difficult path. But it's something. It's something there that we can say, I have hope because I see a road out of here. And so how do you see a road out of here? One, again, in the psychoeducation, it inevitably leads to hope because once you start to understand the mechanism of all this, you start to already formulate clues as to how to reverse engineer it, how to bring down certain chemistry or enhance other chemistry, things that you can do to sort of, again, reverse engineer this process, this escalating, the wheels coming off kind of process during withdrawal. And that in itself starts to give you hope. Hope that, oh, maybe I can have a bigger uh, role in my recovery. Maybe I can bring some of these symptoms down. Maybe things don't have to get so bad after or during the taper, right? So hope restoration can also look like support. It can actually be seeing people around you winning, getting better, doing things they haven't done for years, um, breaking the you know, misconceptions that we have from the benzo community, things that I've heard such as, well, therapy doesn't work and exposure doesn't work and this doesn't work and that doesn't work and we should just all avoid and isolate and lay and pray and eat green, right? Like that's the model. That's the prevailing model in all of this. And I don't know about you, but I found that very hopeless. I needed more than to just wait the storm out and to pray 
and to eat green and to avoid everything that scared me or to be glued to these forums and support groups and, and just be triggered over and over. I mean, it's, it's like we pay such a high price in those support groups, you know, just to have some validation, maybe have some of our questions answered, maybe find a, a Benzo buddy, a true Benzo friend in this mess that we're in. But in order to get those three things, we have to just endure a barrage of triggers, just escalating our limbic system into a deeper and deeper sense of crisis, producing more and more bad chemistry, suppressing more and more good chemistry, you know, uh, conditioning more and more trauma responses, you know, adding more and more maladaptive coping skills. All of this stuff, it just keeps building and building and building. I don't think it's the right model, personally. I think the best model is a kind of insulated environment, a small but loyal support group, the right education, and seeing people around you win. Because people do win. People do beat this. Things can get easier. You can come out of this a better person and more healed than you went into it, with better mental health than you went into the benzos. That's a reality. But you need to see that around you, and we don't see it in the forums. The forums paint a very different picture. Right. So when you start to see people doing things that you want to do, it inspires you. It says, wow, OK, I can get there. Look at look at John or Sally. They're doing it. And that inspiration will actually start to fuel you. And then you'll start to see changes. And once you start to see some positive changes, oh, it's the it's hallelujah. Now you're going, OK, I'm not just believing that there's a possibility. I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing it and feeling it that things are moving in the in the right direction and without having those negative people to pull you back and say yeah but what if you say no what if what if i keep healing like this look at everybody around me these guys are making great progress hope starts to come back now let me again before we move on to step two reiterate how powerful was hope okay well there was an experiment done with these rats right these these poor dang rats <laughs> Always being tortured in experiments. The scientist had a bucket of water and he would put a rat in it and then time it and see how long the rat would swim before it would get tired, give up, and drown. Right, I know, kind of a cruel experiment. On average, these rats would swim, and we're talking about athletic, healthy rats, would swim about 14 to 15 minutes and then they would give up and they would drown. So what he then did was, same experiment, rats would swim right around the 14 minute mark. He would, the scientist would pull the rat out of the water, dry it off, and let it sit on land for a few minutes and then reintroduce it back to the water. Now the rats have a little bit of hope, right? The hope that, well, somebody reached in and pulled me out once, maybe they'll do it again before I can drown. Take a guess at how long, when the rats were reintroduced to the water, how long they could swim. And remember, at first, 15 minutes on average. The second time, 60 hours. 60 hours. That's over 240 times the, the original length. One rat even swam as long as 81 hours. So pretty incredible. And on the effect that hope has on people is even greater than that because it's not just about not giving up and, and pushing the body through amazing things, but it releases good chemistry. It reduces bad chemistry, right? Hope, I mean, there's a whole science behind hope that is just unbelievable. So it's not one of these throwaway things. So again, step one, psychoeducation and restoring hope. Once you do those two things, you're rejuvenated. You've got a path. You've got some direction, right? Now you know what to do. You've got the blueprint. Step two, this is very, very important. And this is where a lot of people go wrong. You create a pure safe space, right? And you do this through something I call uh, building upon the five senses of the limbic retraining. I have a whole model for this in my school. Um, it's essentially using your senses to retrain your limbic system that you're not in imminent danger. There's a, there's a lot more to it, but but that's it in a nutshell. Now think of it this way. You're in the woods. You are deep in the woods. You're lost in the woods. You get attacked by a grizzly bear. Oh my God, you barely escape. Now the bear has been, been kind of stalking you. He's hunting you. 
and you tried to run up trees, he can climb a tree. You, you found a cave. You hid in the cave. He, he can enter the cave. You go down to the water to get a drink. Well, he goes down to the water and drinks too. He sees you. Oh, my God. You run away. You find some food. He smells the food. He comes after you again. It's like, oh, my God. Everything I do, this damn bear, he's, he's stalking me. I can't get away from him. I can't fight him. I can't outrun him. Nobody's coming for me. I don't know how to get out of here. I'm virtually unsafe in everything I do, everywhere I turn. So what do we do? Well, first, what is the implication of this? The implication is a limbic system that is going to go into overdrive and lock itself up in there and say, you know what? This isn't a, a fleeting danger. We are in massive danger. We are in crisis survival mode. And what it does when it enters in that mode, it starts pumping negative uh, chemistry, so to speak, you know, high, high levels of cortisol, high, high levels of adrenaline. It, it suppresses GABA automatically. Forget benzos, right? It automatically suppresses GABA. Nobody's having a Zen moment while, uh, you know, fighting off a, a grizzly bear. It, but it doesn't just suppress GABA. It suppresses dopamine. It suppresses oxytocin, that love molecule. It, it suppresses serotonin. It suppresses acetylcholine, histamine. It creates a cascade of physiological changes in the body, right? This is why we develop ulcers because of these, these dynamic changes, for example, in the, in the gastro system of our body. Our blood pressure goes up. Our bronchioles and our lungs dilate to take in more oxygen. More oxygen translates to the blood. More nutrients are carried to uh, external muscles, peripheral limbs, you know. Um, all the blood moves sort of away from the core of the body and into our limbs so we can run and fight and grab and climb. And all these changes, the aperture in your eye gets enhanced. Your hearing gets enhanced. Your sense of touch, smell, taste, all your senses. Everything is enhanced in kind of a neat way for a second. You're almost like superhuman. Uh, but then it goes one step further and it hits you full of a chemical fear, a chemical fear message that tells you basically paints the picture of what would happen if you didn't evade that bear. I mean, it, it, it gives you the signal. It's very, a very real signal that you are going to die. Impending doom is on its way. Run, fight. So now that we have an idea of this sort of incredible physiological and even psychological process that process that happens through this limbic firing we can see the implication of how important it is to bring this back down right because as our bad chemistry is flourishing our good chemistry is suppressed we are almost again dead in the water i mean even healing the brain and all the things we need all the resources we need to repair our brain and our nervous system is now being suppressed by this fight or flight survival mechanism and again, part of what it does is it says, okay, it's almost like a country going to war. It says, well, we only have so many resources, so we need to allo allocate that to the army. In this case, it would be like the, the senses, the external limbs, that kind of thing. And so as it does that, it sort of shuts down and neglects certain systems in the body. Right, so now that's how we start to develop certain uh, insulin uh, changes, uh, gastrointestinal changes, but not only that, the prolonged stress, that elevated heart rate and all of these things, elevated blood pressure, that starts to have an effect in our bodies for negative, for the worst. So again, the five senses limbic retraining, creating a pure safe space is our goal here. And what does that look like in this analogy? It's like, well, you can't fight the bear. You can't outrun them. You're, no one's coming for you. So you know what you need to do? You need to collect some wood and build you a shelter, some kind of wall between you and the bear. Yes, the bear could probably still break down that shelter and get you at least at first until you reinforce it, but it's a start. It's something to separate us. And, and how I see that, that process uh, and this metaphor is through the five senses limbic retraining. And it won't just be done through CBT and, and, and self-talk because this, the bear is too clever. The limbic system is too clever. The more you try to talk you know, the bearer down or away, it can actually kind of work against you. It can actually become a trigger, but we can get into that at another time. So again, step one, psychoeducation, restoring hope. Then we move into creating a true, pure, safe space, a, a space where our limbic system can finally say, you know what, when I'm in this little cabin, 
I can kind of let down the guard a bit. I can let us sleep. I can bring down hyperarousal. I can stop flooding the body for full of these fight or flight chemicals. And I can stop suppressing those good, you know, those other good chemicals. And it might be fleeting at first, but you have to work this. And it could take it easily. I tell everyone, spend 60 days doing this daily. It is a it is a game of numbers. It is not a technique. It's not a light switch you flicker. It's not or it's not a light switch you flip. It's not a fire extinguisher you spray. This is a system. We are retraining nerves. And there's so much more to it. Again, I'm trying to give you a quick condensed version of all of this stuff. Um, moving on to step three. So after we've done those things, hope, education, we're creating a safe space. We're starting to bring down that hyper arousal from that fight or flight mode that was triggered by chemical withdrawal from benzos, of course. All right, benzo, of course, benzos are influencing all of this. Step three, we start to build skill sets and we're starting to build neuroplasticity. All right, we again, this is an order. You can't just jump to this stage. You can't start building skill sets when you don't feel safe, when you don't have education, you have no hope to even get started, right? But okay, here we are. Step three, we're building skill sets. We're adding neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is huge. It's going to actually regrow and retrain the brain. We talk about receptor damage and, and, and all these processes. Well, neuroplasticity is the ability not just to regenerate, but to re sort of relocate functions of the brain and processes of the brain to, to ensure still homeostasis is possible. So neuroplasticity, if we give into this, we help the body and the brain's natural instincts to heal and do this, we could have uh, tremendous results, tremendous results. And by the way, neuroplasticity and skill building, skill set building, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned, I think most psych psychologists and mental health experts out there would agree this is not optional, guys. This is this is a must. This is like having a double knee replacement surgery and then just sitting on the couch. Like you need to go to rehab. If you don't go to rehab, sure, the surgery will heal, but your tendons will shrink. Your muscles will atrophy. You won't walk right, potentially. You have to do the rehab. So look at this as the rehab. This is where the rehab is really beginning here. Skill set building, uh, again, which is different than technique building or just using a technique. Like walking is, a, is not a technique. You just do that. Right. But learning something like mindfulness, for example, that is a technique that is, or excuse me, that is a skill set. That is a technique that is going to take time. Now, OK, here we are. We're at, we're now moved to step three. We're we're getting some momentum. We're building skill sets. We're building neuroplasticity. And we're starting to feel a bit better. However, now we're starting to yo-yo. We're still having these tough moments where maybe at this point we're coming off the drug or we've already come off the drug and we're still falling back on some old maladaptive coping. And I often call this the yo-yo phase because we do, we yo-yo between we start to have bigger windows and then stronger waves. And we just kind of teeter back and forth, back and forth. It feels such a, like a, such a bipolar ride during this time. And it's very confusing. And I'll have videos and more on the yo-yo phase and what to do about it. But I'll give you a clue right now. The, the main emphasis in this step is removing maladaptive coping that's bad coping right the number one and trauma reflexes but of course number one removing maladaptive coping what does that look like what does that mean i'm talking about the, those default things we do to try to soothe our anxieties that really are actually negative for us you know you wake up high cortisol boom you immediately jump on benzo buddies or some kind of support group and you read horror stories and, and suddenly we're ruminating in bed for the next four hours you know, we're living on support groups. We're we're watching. Um, you know, we're we're reading tons of uh, WebMD and things of that nature. Right now, we're we're digesting triggers after triggers. We're on. You know, we're watching video after video, and I mean, it's a ton of things. It's avoidance. It's isolation. It's um, uh, you know, negative self view. It's it's it, for everybody. It's different what these things are. I mean, they really are different for everyone. Um, but it's so important that we identify them because every time we give into one of those things, it can quite literally, my friends, keep you locked in a vicious cycle. It can, it can be like an undertow. It just keeps you down, right? You can't get out of this. And then you're so close to freedom, but you just keep yo-yoing. You start to have good windows when you're able to sort of reverse engineer some of the maladaptive coping or, or you're not leaning on them so hard or the trauma reflexes aren't kicking in so much. You start to have these great moments and then... 
bam, you're back in it. And the trauma reflexes and, re and the maladaptive coping, they share an intimate relationship. They, they, you know, it's almost like the trauma reflex triggers the maladaptive coping. So talking a little bit about the trauma reflexes, what is that? Well, simply put, going through benzos is a traumatic experience. I think everybody here would agree on that. It is damn traumatic, especially the longer you've been in it, the harder your fight's been, the things that you've lost, the gaslighting, everything. It is a traumatic experience. And in neuroplasticity, we have a saying, uh, nerves that fire together wire together. They, they, they wire together, two stimuluses. So every time you have that symptom, uh, say a heart palpitation, and you've had that anxiety attached to it, that fear, which heart palpitations are usually a result of that chemical fear, right, that, that withdrawal, these things start to wire together. Then before you know it, you can just talk about a heart, palpita or heart palpitations and you feel fear and you'll start to develop them. It becomes very psychogenic, very re reactive of the limbic system. And these, these trauma reflexes can run deep. These trauma reflexes breed rumination and rumination creates anxiety, depression, insomnia, trauma, health anxieties, all kinds of stuff, psychogenic effects, nocebo effects. So, so identifying trauma reflexes and learning how to rewire that, learning how to process that, learning how to retrain those areas of the brain uh, is of the utmost importance. I see so many people here at step four getting stuck because they, they just can't see this or they don't have the right tools to sort of, again, reverse engineer it for a better, for lack of a better word, right? We're trying to, and I love that term reverse engineer because that's, that is what we're doing. We're not just adding some new technology here. We're finding where things went wrong in this sort of unfolding process and we're just bringing it into reverse. We're just, we're just going to run this right backwards. And that's a great way of doing it. So I've made this very uh, condensed and simple as, as I can. I still went over 23 minutes so far trying to break this all down. Um, there's so much more to be said here, but this is, is I've, guys, if I, as I have worked with, like I said, thousands of people at this point from all over the planet, I have seen so much. I have seen people in every situation you could not imagine. Um, and I can tell you what I see in those support groups and in, in all of these groups, they don't, they're not a true reflection of what the bigger picture is, right? It just really isn't. That's not my experience. Things do not have to get worse as you get lower or come off the drug. Um, therapy absolutely can work if you have the right techniques, right? Everything has its own right techniques, timing, nuances. That's where things go wrong. If you don't know the nuances and the specifics of these things, well, yeah, then they could be useless, right? You can't, you got to have the right tool for the, for the right job. So that's very important. Um, there is a lot of hope here. There is a lot of hope. I've seen so many people improve and get their life back and and do better. I mean, literally tell me, Dave, I feel better now than I did before benzos. And that was my experience as well. And that's what I'm after. I don't want to see you guys just survive this or come out like some disfigured, disabled person that's just happy to be alive. No, let's thrive. Let's 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 beat this thing and and make it a mission, make it a purpose. Find you know, like an alchemist, learn to transmute suffering into to gold. It can happen. But we need the right path. We need the right steps. We need the right program. We, re, we need the right effort, the right mindset, the right hope. All of that is is super important. And, and one thing I, I've hammered, you know, for the duration of my career in this area so far, and I will continue to hammer, is that the people that work a program, the people that understand this and, and, and utilize this, hands down get better. And so many of you guys write me with questions. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I avoid this? Should I avoid that? And, and you're looking for something that is going to speed up the process, facilitate your recovery. But it's always in areas that I go, you know, guys, that question would be answered or, or that fear would be so much less significant if we just did this. If we just got with this program, right? If we did these things, that'll, that'll all work itself out, right? Like we're kind of doing this long math to try to solve something that won't be solved by that equation, but could be solved with a much simpler equation. Do this. But the rumination wants you to grip onto these unanswerable questions. You know, please understand that. And if you don't understand that, I have videos on rumination that break that down beautifully. I think you should, you know, definitely digest that material if you haven't. 
at any rate, my friends, just wanted to share this with you. You know, five steps on the path of recovery. I didn't say much about that fa- uh, that last step, the fifth step, because it's more about just reemerging into our life, and that is a, sta- a stage, and that is a a process in itself. There, you know, there's there is a lot to be said about that, but I felt these first four steps were most important. And again, developmental, my friends. This is a a process. You go from one to two to three to four to five. You don't jump in line there, right? And if you, as you notice, listening to everything I've said, it's the antithesis to a lot of the bad advice going on in the groups. Now, you might be asking yourself, you know, Coach Powers, how do I do these things specifically? And in that, I would say I've got a whole program that I have been working for the last 10 years. I have, I mean, I have do- donated my life. I have dedicated my life to, to answering that question. And outside of these videos, I would say check out the school. Because the school has an amazing support group, amazing amount of resources, and a full video course that's growing that will soon encompass over 40 video lessons on all of this. All right, my friends, keep your head up. I hope this was helpful. If it was, give me a like, maybe a comment. Let me know some of your thoughts. Keep your head up. You are healing. You will heal. And when you get to the other side, tell them Coach Powers told you so. Hey everyone, I'm Coach Powers and I'm excited to announce the launch of my new online Benzo Recovery School. The school launched with Module 1 and will have a total of four modules, each module with a dozen or more video lessons. Here are some contents in Module 1. This creates the basis for my recovery program. If you know anything about my approach to Benzo Recovery, you know I'm a bit different than other Benzo coaches in that I do not subscribe to the lay and pray model of recovery. Instead, I believe benzo injury is a kind of neurological injury that requires neurological rehabilitation. This neurological rehabilitation encompasses learning how to access our good chemistry while also reducing the so-called bad chemistry, cortisol and adrenaline, and also learning how to lull down our hypervigilant limbic system. This includes learning techniques in CBT, DBT, mindfulness therapy, and neuroplasticity building. Now, I've studied clinical psychology for the last 15 years of my life, and my Benzo Recovery Program encompasses the same things that I use to make my own recovery after a 10-year, 40 milligram volume dependence. My recovery program observes four stages of recovery with three tiers of development. In fact, my stages are all focused on development. This makes them different than the three obvious stages of recovery, which include the pre-taper, the taper, and post-taper. Instead, my stages serve as a kind of developmental roadmap, with each stage serving as a bridge to the following stage. These four stages include Stage 1, Restoring Hope, Stage 2, The New Beginning, Stage 3, The Montage, and Stage 4, Coming Home. Perhaps most importantly, each stage has three key learning goals and also three key roadblocks. These stages revealed themselves to me after years of working with literally thousands of people from all around the world. After enough experience, you begin to see patterns and trends, and you see where people triumph and what roadblocks can prevent them from moving forward. Now remember, just because you may have come off your benzo doesn't mean you automatically reach stage four, the final stage. Again, these are developmental stages, which is why someone can come off of their benzo and still be stuck in the recovery. In fact, it's entirely possible to come off of your benzo and be stuck in stage one. Here are some other features the online Benzo Recovery School offers. Aside from being a school, it's also a positive focused support group. And believe me when I tell you, my students are a different breed of Benzo warriors. They are wise, they are driven, and they understand the mission. I, Coach Powers, will also be doing live video Q&A weekly in the community, talking, teaching, and answering questions from all of you. There will be downloadable resources such as a rumination and exposure therapy log, templates for checklists, and much more. Additionally, there will be new Benzo sleep affirmation videos exclusive for the school, as well as new and early original content. There will be a regular Benzo blog, Benzo-related news, and even a private early screening for my Benzo Recovery feature film, Lake of Fire. All of this and only for a special introductory rate of $30 monthly while time lasts. So come join the positive community and let's work together on facilitating our recovery. See you there.